Amen. That's about the size of it. That about tells the tale. <laughs> Amen. All right, if you'd take your Bibles again this evening to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Try and wind up this, this message. Let me, let me read through this again. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. With all them, uh, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were, you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. God uh, chose Paul to be the penman of the predominant uh, sections of the New Testament that are church doctrine. And boy, he certainly had a way of emphasizing what God wanted uh, pointed out. Truth, fellowship, service, integrity, uh, unity, and just all of it do the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one worthy. We spoke this morning about the call of grace in each of our lives. Uh, there's a, a call uh, in, the, in verse 1 there for uh, Paul to be an apostle. But all weren't called to be apostle. But there's a call in verse 2 for all that are called to be saints. Uh, God has a perfect plan, a perfect will for each and every one of us. Uh, some, of, some of our lives we're going to talk about tonight uh, in, a, in a, a, a new section here are to live out that life as saints. And to, to respond to that call to be saints, not just by, yeah, okay, but by our lives, not being just hearers of the word, but doers only, lest we be deceiving ourselves. So we receive the call of grace, which brought us into the family of God. And the truth of the matter is, is that uh, the Lord calls a bunch of people. Look with me uh, over in Matthew chapter 11, and then we'll uh, read that verse and then pray. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his, uh, his call, he says in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are of heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's an invitation that suits and fits, provides for the needs of every single human being that has ever lived and ever will live. All people come to a point of just weariness of the, of the flesh and of the spirit, come to a point where they're just so needy that uh, they don't even know what to, to look for anymore or who to call on. And the Lord says, come unto me. I'll take you. I'll answer you. I'll be your God. I'll be your Savior. I'll be the one who gives you rest. That call of grace is a great place to be. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you tonight for each one here. We pray, God, that uh, all of the, the health needs and circumstances and traveling and uh, ministry needs. I pray for Brother Bob and his uh, uh, need of a piano player or, or help next uh, uh, Sunday will be uh, it will be answered. And uh, God, just uh, trust you to be the sufficiency for all these things. Lord, we we just sang that song. If if the whole sky were a parchment and every every uh, stalk on earth a, a quill, 
All the, wa all the, uh, the oceans wouldn't provide enough ink to talk about how great is the love of God. Lord, sometimes we think about how lonely we are or how alone we are. God, ever at that point, remind us that's a choice. We can draw nigh to you. We can call on you. We can come to you and have the fellowship, have the help, have the shoulder to lean on and the, the, the hand to hold to get us through our trials. Lord, please bless each one. God, have uh, something uh, in the message tonight for each one here that'll be a help and encouragement for them. And Lord, that we might spread that further to use that same help that we've got, the same comfort that we got to be a comfort to others. Lord, thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we uh, talked about a uh, call of grace. We've talked about a call of enrichment. We're rich beyond measures. We make Croesus look like a pauper. Uh, all of the riches that this world has can all be put into a vault somewhere and then sit back and worry about somebody coming in to get it. But the Bible says that when our treasures are laid up in heaven, the thief can't get in and the moth, uh, moth doesn't uh, uh, come in there and it doesn't rust or corrupt. So God is keeping our treasures safe for us, in us, all about us. We talked about a call to patient waiting as we go through this world. Every morning I get up, it's amazing to me how wicked things have become, how, how perverse uh, people are just in general. And uh, I look around and say, well, I'm, I'm still here. There's still grace available. There's still help available for anybody who needs it. All they have to do is uh, turn their eyes and their hearts to the Lord Jesus, and he will help them. This, this patience is something that Bible says that patience has a perfect work that is to be done in our lives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, probably later on, just in the finishing remarks on our, our message here. But the reality is, is that uh, patience is a tough kind of thing when you don't know when it's going to come or when you're going to need it. It's great to be patient until it goes beyond your patience. <laughs> and everybody has that place where it just doesn't seem to last that long. Jeremiah was a uh, patient brother, or brother Dave, I think it was mentioned it the other night uh, in preaching about Jeremiah. They finally just gave up and he said, I'm not going to mention your name anymore. I'm not going to talk to anybody about you. But God's word in him was burning and he just couldn't stop. Just when you think you had enough, you realize there's some people that really need to know the Lord. They need a witness. They need somebody that will stand up and take their part to God as a priest and a minister to them. That, folks, is the job of the saints. That is our work. I want to mention tonight, there's a call down here, way down in verse 8 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Our call to be blameless. People have the idea, well, nobody's sinless. It didn't say sinless. It said blameless. And blameless, uh, you find out, is a little bit different than sinless in that it's something you can do. Blameless is just everything that you know to do, do it. And God won't blame you because you did it. Sinless is something that probably no human being quite has the capacity to do it, even, uh, even with the uh, power of the Holy Ghost. I, I almost hate to say that because it sounds like, well, you just don't think God could do it. No, God could do it. I, he's not in question. <laughs> Here's the question. <laughs> but he says you can't be blameless. Uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth were blameless before the law. That's saying something. That law was a hard taskmaster. That, that law was written in stone and it drove people, but they were blameless. They hadn't done nothing, anything according to the, uh, their lives that violated the law. You know, the Bible, I mentioned this morning and, uh, as we were closing, that what God tells us is to keep His commandments because His commandments are not grievous unto us. And that is, is love God above all else and love your neighbor as yourself. If we can keep those simple, uh, simple things in mind, it'd stop a whole lot of strife. It'd stop a whole lot of problems in this world. Every now and then you run across some, some uh, character and they think, well, if God's so good, why is the world such a mess? And the answer is just starkly simple. Who's doing anything that he told them to do? If they'd obey God, it'd be a great world to live in. It wouldn't be sinless. 
Most people probably wouldn't be blameless, but it'd still be a whole lot better world than it is now. But the Bible says that we may be blameless in the day of our, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in Ephesians 6, it says, having done all, therefore, stand. It's, it's just as simple as that, finding out what are your orders. Uh, Brother Herb's uh, in the military, John was, I was, uh, Jim is. And you realize there are certain orders. Uh, you talk about a general today. When the general gives you an order, you don't give him excuses. He's not interested in excuses. All he wants, yes, sir, and get, turn on your heels and get to it. What he wants is a response that honors his position. You and I deal with a holy God that created everything for his own pleasure. When he says something to us, it's not a suggestion. We ought to take that as one of the commandments of the Lord. Even if it's simply go witness to that guy. Well, I don't really want to. Well, the Lord's not going to make you do it. But you're missing out on something of his blessing by disobedience. Be blameless until that day. Having done all to stand, our lives ought to be affected by the knowledge that at any moment that the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, could be right over our heads. It, that's a joyous thought, isn't it? How about if you're in disobedience to God when he shows up? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Quite honestly, it's still going to be a great day. Maybe, maybe not for everybody, but it's going to be a good day for me. If it was the worst day of my life, it'd still be the best day uh, that would ever come after that. But it ought to be the best day that we look forward to. It ought to be a day we look forward to with anticipation. Not of, oh, no, I'm going to get a beaten. <laughs> you know, the old expression, your father's going to be home and you're going to get it when he gets here. All that. No, not like that. Not in the terror of him coming. In the relief of his coming, the joy of his coming, the, the pleasure of seeing the one who loved us and gave his life as a ransom for sinners, for our iniquity, who gave his soul as a ransom for us. We ought to be thrilled to death. He's coming. And live our life in daily, moment by moment expectancy to hear that voice from heaven call us up and to see that uh, shining, glorious Savior appear and call us home. People uh, talk about, well, there's going to be a secret rapture. I never quite understood that. It may be a secret to the world, but quite frankly, most everything seems to be a secret to them. The truthfulness to us is, uh, man, we're going to be alert and awake that day more than any day that you've ever lived up until then. Say, so, what do you mean? Even if you're dead, you're going to be wide awake that day. Say, well, I'm a kind of a sleepyhead. You'll be wide awake that day. He'll uh, make sure you are. The Bible says in uh, 1 John 3, 3, that every man that hath this hope of seeing the Lord, of expecting him, purifies himself even as he is pure. Listen, if there's anything that ought to keep us on our toes, it's the Lord's coming. The parables Jesus gave about the good man, uh, a thief came broke in his house. If the good man had known what, what time he was going to break in, he would have been prepared. He would have done something about it. What did he do? He didn't. As it was in the days of Noah, they knew not till the flood came and took them all away. If they'd have known that was coming, you think they wouldn't have been out there trying to hammer together some tree trunks and make a, make a raft? Might have been the last minute, but they would have been trying to do something. You and I have got 2,000 years of warning in this book that one of these days your Savior's coming for you. We better concentrate on, on expecting that day. The Bible says now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. We're not, it's been 2,000 years, but we're not moving further from that event. We're moving ever so close to that moment by moment and day by day. It gets closer. Sooner or later, the Lord's going to have enough of this world just like we are. He's coming to get us. I think he lives in every, every bit of the level of anticipation of coming to redeem his bride, that that bride is just waiting for the bridegroom to come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And the world says, well, I just don't see anything to get excited about. If you could understand us, uh, just for a minute what was coming during the next seven years after he came, Nobody would ever say something as silly as that. They'd be shaking in their shoes and say, where's the nearest place to get saved? Somebody tell me what I must do to be born again. How can I escape the wrath of God for my sin? But today, people, I'm okay. I'm good. 
I guess they honestly think that. I got bad news for them. There's none that doeth good, none that seeketh after God, none righteous, no, not one. Keep our minds occupied. Put away sin from us. Put away things that, that would dirty our soul, blemish our spirit. Put a, put a bad taste on, on even the, our, our neighbor's mouths from us. We ought to be some level of testimony to the rest of the world. In verse, uh, verse 6 there, where it says, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You know, there's some people... They look at you, and they, probably something that happens in your life, they look at it, eh, I don't know whether he's a Christian or not. And then you do something, you say something. You know what you did? You just eliminated any doubt. They, they believe you are. They, they, they're not maybe any more convinced they need to be, but they're pretty convinced you are. And that ought to be our life's goal, to make everybody around us understand, I'm not just talking religious stuff. I'm not just telling you what a Baptist ought to do. I'm telling you what God said that is for your blessing, for your benefit. We were talking to somebody the other day and just, just about the past. And in the past, I, I was a pretty rough preacher, I think. <laughs> if not all the time, at least I had my moments. And the older I get, and, it, and it, it made for some tough preaching, even for me. I just struggle over messages and struggle to get this done. Struggle. You know what I finally realized? You're, you're trying so hard to have a really good message. You're not enjoying it. You're right. I mean, what I said was right. I, to my knowledge, I've never told anybody anything that was wrong. But you're not enjoying it. Well, and I'm talking, having this conversation with myself, I think. The Lord's kind of prompting each section of it. But I thought, yeah, you know, if I, if I had a better time, maybe I'd have a better response from it. The Lord said, yeah, I bet you would. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to tell people how wonderful my Savior is. I'm going to tell people how wonderful the Bible is. I'm going to tell them how good the Father is and how gracious the Holy Spirit is, how wonderful it is to sit in church with people that you know are going to be your friends and maybe eternal neighbors. Doesn't that make a difference in the way you think about people? If you meet people that are passing through your life, you can be a little brisk. You can be a little kind of push them off. You meet somebody who's going to live next door to you for the rest of your life, you might as well just determine, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make friends. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be at peace with them. I'm going to be a help to them because God only knows I want them to be a help to me. And all of a sudden, your life will begin changing. You start looking at people as not as, well, them. <laughs> their lives can be a challenge. Their lives can be somebody to win to the Lord. There, there, there are people that you can help encourage in their walk with the Lord if they're saved. There's all kinds of things the Lord can bring in there. The, the confirmation of our, our testimony ought to be the Lord's amen on what we say. And when we get that, I think the world even looks on and smiles just a little bit. Might kill them to do it, but I think they will. Some people think they can live anything they want. It's okay with God. By the way, there's a name for that. It's called antinomianism. It's a, it's a lawless condition when people mistake the grace of God for lasciviousness or uh, maybe just another way to say it, be really just loose, carnal living. And uh, the modern church age seems to have developed perfectly to suit that goal and that attitude where it's no longer preaching holiness, no longer preaching uh, the 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 perfection that God desires in His people. But just, man, come as you are, rock on for Jesus, have a great time, cool it. We're all going to have a good time. I'm as, I'm as for having a good time as anybody else. But holiness is a whole different story. And if your good time doesn't involve holiness, uh, you're not going to enjoy that good time very long, I can tell you that. And the fact that Jesus might be coming before we finish this message I'll tell you what, I preach, and I, I, I'm not big on altar calls. I might take on that. A guy asked me one time, well, why don't you make the altar call longer? My take on that is, man, I just beat those people for an hour and 10 minutes sometimes, maybe longer, maybe a little bit less, but at least 45 minutes, probably almost never shorter than that. That's opening prayer. And if they haven't figured out what they need to do, 
I'm not going to have any more success if I take another two hours at it. And there are people, you know, every head bow, every eye uh, uh, closed. And, and if you need this and if you need that, you get it down to finally, if you're going to have to shave tomorrow morning or go to work or, or you're going to lay in bed sick, you need to get to the altar. Well, I, I guess you could do that. But don't come just because I called you. You need to come because the Spirit of God prompted you to do something in your life, prompted you to move, prompted you to change something, prompted you to pray, maybe about somebody else in a different way. Whatever it is, I don't know, and I can't, I can't think it up for you. But God does. He wants you to be blameless before Him. Our lives are to be lived out before this world filled with unbelievers and backslidden Christians. That Bible says, let me, let me read you a verse over here, Philippians chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2. See if this is the picture of your life. And if it isn't, you ought to hit that altar. I'll tell you right now. Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 2. In verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to talk about a self-deprecating position the Lord Jesus Christ took so that he could win somebody to himself. Then down in verse 12, it says, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you to uh, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain." Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. You know what Paul's happy about? His life has been used to bless others. His life has been used to meet the needs of others. That, that's a, quite a call. All too often we live our lives sort of as a, an island to ourselves and we do what we want. We live the way we want. And it doesn't necessarily need to be bad, but it's selfish. It doesn't have to necessarily have to be sinful, but it's self-centered. We need to do, be those harmless and blameless sons of God in this crooked world. The world will notice. In verse 9, there's a call. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, God calls us into fellowship. There's a verse in Hebrews, I believe it's 9.25, it says, not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, and so much the more, uh, as a matter of some is, and so much the more as you see uh, the day approaching. And there are some folks, well, I don't need to go to church, I am the church. Uh, that's as nutty as the guy that says, well, I don't, I don't need to, 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 to go to church to study the Bible. I can study the Bible at home. Well, that just shows you had no idea what he's talking about. Because that Bible says that he gave teachers for the, for the edification of the body, for the perfection of the saints, and for the, for the work of the ministry. Teachers' job is to teach people to help them those things. How many of you have had the benefit of teachers that helped you learn things that you could have undoubtedly learned them yourself should you live two or three lifetimes? I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, one of the first things I learned in that Bible is, man, I read something 10 times. I'd try and figure it out. I don't know what that means. I'd go ask somebody. And I, I had a, a fellow that, that guy studied the Bible. That guy had been saved for, for uh, probably longer than I'd even been alive at that point. And I'd go ask him and he'd tell me, oh yeah, you know what that guy did? That guy just cut 20 years off my learning. I'd I, I jump in where he finished. You know, there, there's an old expression that uh, uh, one of the prophets said, if, if I seem to see things further than other men, it's only because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. 
It's not all of us ourselves. It's us teaching, passing along, encouraging. Man, I, I'm thrilled when I see young men uh, begin their, their, these Bible courses and learning the Bible and taking the Bible serious and reading and studying and preaching and, and desiring to do something that God can use. You know, that's, that's fellowship in the Holy Ghost. That's fellowship in God's Word. Those are things that God can take and use and say, man, I'm going to bless that church. If every guy in there wants to preach, they're, they're, they're going to be struggling to find out who's going to learn and get the best message put together. Who's going to get the invitation? Who's going to get to preach? That's not bad. That Bible says if you want to covet, covet the best gifts. You want something from God? Ask Him for the best. The best is to be a blessing to somebody else. I bet every time somebody asks that, God gives them to it. He gives it to them. Call the fellowship. How's your fellowshipping with the Lord? A lot of times we, we mistake fellowship at church with the Lord. Listen, don't get me wrong. I am all for fellowship at church. I am one of those old time people. I think when the doors are open, you ought to be there. I mean, if you can't, I, I understand that. If you won't, I understand that. <laughs> I don't like that. And one day you're not going to like that. But I understand it. And all that is is misplaced desires. If we keep the Lord first, if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, everything else in life we're looking for will settle down into its proper place. It's the old water seeking its own level. God's got everything just figured out perfectly, perfectly matched and balanced for you. But you've got to let Him make the choices. There's an old expression that God, God gives the best to people who leave the choices to Him. Boy, I tell you what, that's about as true as life gets. Every time you and I make decisions that are based on what we think, our opinion, our feelings, uh, they never seem to work out quite as well as what saith the Lord. What's the Bible say about those things? What if I'm, I just leave the choice to God? And that's not making, listen, I don't even want to imply in that that you're making wrong choices. Just not God's choice. You know, Paul had a chance of avoiding at least some of the, the terrible things that happened to him. But you know what his heart was? His heart was, go tell those people how to get saved. You know something? I don't, God, through the Holy Spirit, warned him through, through the Holy Spirit, through prophets and so forth. Don't go to Jerusalem. They're not going to receive your testimony. Paul says, I go bound, <laughs> bound to Jerusalem. <laughs> He says, I, I can't get out of it. I, I just love those people. I want to go. I never read God reprimanding him. You can say, well, he, he was out of the will of God. I think maybe he was. I, I, I might be all wet. And I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try and make that a doctor. I think he was. If God warned him, don't go there. He didn't say you shouldn't go. He said, don't go there. His heart was to go. God didn't condemn him for going. And God ultimately got out of Paul what he wanted. He went and testified before kings. Wonder what life would be like for Paul had he said, you're right, Lord. You didn't call me to go back to Jerusalem. That selfish desire for my people, my kinsmen, maybe I'll just go do what you told me to do. Who knows where that would have led him. God right? Always. Always. How's your fellowship? Don't replace it with church. Don't replace it with friends. They're not God. They're not Jesus. Don't replace prayer with fellowship. We have Wednesday night prayer meeting. I think that's, that's probably one of the most important nights of the week when people actually get out and they get to pray. And it's encouraging when you hear other fellows pray, when you hear families pray, when you see people get together and bow their heads and their hearts and, and talk to the Lord. And I know you could, you could talk to the Lord sitting in your car. You could talk to the Lord sitting in a recliner in your living room. But there's something about getting together with other people and praying that is encouraging. Having other people drawn into your your needs, your, your desires, your uh, activities, and what you need God's blessing for. There's something about that fellowship. Uh, it's not replaceable uh, with anything else. In 1 Corinthians 3, uh, uh, 3 and 9, uh, Paul talked about 
being uh, to that church laborers together with God. I don't know if you think of yourself like that, but picture this. Jim and I are going to go do a little job. We're going to go do something, and Jim goes off to do that, and I'm looking at my brain. Well, you know, I got some other things to do. And he goes off and he starts working on that. I'm just fiddling around over here. Yeah, you know, I should have gone. I just, I just didn't. Yeah, I let him do it himself. I'm not laboring with him. He's by himself. He's doing it himself. Two people working on something or have fellowship. Two people pulling the pulling a a heavy load, have fellowship. Let's not leave all this to the Lord. He's graciously allowed us to come in to take part of his work in this world. You know, you think, think about this. God wants the, the gospel preached to the world, right? And during the tribulation period, a strong angel goes out and preaches. How long do you think it takes an angel that can fly, that's probably got a voice that can be heard, you know, who knows? How long do you think it's going to take him to preach so that everybody hears something? A day? Two days? Three days? We've been 2,000 years at this. You know what? There are less people hearing the gospel today than there ever have been. I, I think that's astounding, but it's due to the, 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 incre the geometric explosion and the in population, and the, at the same time, the, the Christian population has not matched that accelerated growth. There's something in our fellowship that seems to be sometimes amiss. We need individual fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, uh, in verse 9 of our chapter here, God is faithful by whom you were called. Do you ever think about how God is faithful to you? Let, let me put it this way. And, it, you know, the, the, there, there's an old expression. It's the test of the other. Does the other shoe fit? If, if I'm expecting God to be faithful, am I as faithful to him as I want him to be? In other words, is it... Mutual, reciprocal. If I prayed to God and I expected God to answer the way that I pray, how, how sincere am I? How often does that happen? How determined am I in my prayer life? That faithful God, you know what he's looking down here? He sees sons of God, those born again Christians. Now, I don't know about you, but I, most every father when they have sons, you know what they, they look for? As they're growing and everybody around them looks for the same thing, a family likeness. Well, that looks like, uh, that looks like your great grandpa. Yeah, why is that? Well, he has no hair, no teeth. <laughs> and then later on, well, he's got your father's jaw, jawline, got dad's mustache. And this, this, I'll go there. I want to see a likeness. Do you ever wonder if the Lord looks down from heaven and says, man, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're mine, but boy, they don't look nothing like me. <laughs> they don't act like anything like me, and they don't, apparently not thinking like me. Or does he look down into your house, into your heart, and say, you know what? I can see that likeness, that family likeness growing. I, I can see it taking shape. I can see it forming in them. Proud of them. They'll be identified as one of mine. That call from a faithful God. I don't know too many people that got saved the first time they heard the gospel. There, I'm sure there are some. It, that wasn't me. I'm sure there are some. I think one of the most comforting, th comforting things I know, the reason I can stand here in this pulpit and say I am saved, not that I hope I'm saved, is God said if I believed on him, he'd save me. All oh, my confidence doesn't rest in me. My confidence rests in a God who cannot lie. Not like these new Bibles that God won't lie. 
I've had people tell me, I won't lie to you and lie to me. Right to my face. God can't lie. Men may or may not be what they say they are, but God always is. Churches may or may not be what they claim. God always is. Governments, politicians are almost never what they claim they are. But God always is. He says, I'm the high and the lofty one that inhabits eternity. I've looked around. There is no God save me. Ain't nobody like me up here. Ain't nobody like me anywhere. And here's a God that is omnipotent, omniscient. He's seen every corner. You know, when an atheist says, there is no God, you know what that implies? They're omniscient. They've looked everywhere in everything that exists, every place. And they haven't found God. Most of them I've seen couldn't, couldn't look up, let alone look to the ends of the earth or the ends of the universe. Our calling comes from a faithful God. Now think about this, how faithful God is. How would you like to have a husband or a wife like this? No matter how poorly you performed, they loved you. No matter how much you let yourself go, they love you. No matter who you got tangled up with, as bad as it might hurt them, they love you. And then think about the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostle uh, Peter. When Peter's standing by that fire warming his hands and Jesus comes out there and says he looked on Peter. Peter says, I don't even know him. I don't know who that is. Not me. I bet it near killed him to say that. But you know what? That man that would take a sword in the, in the face of a mob of men and cut it, just start swinging, cut a man's ear off. Bold denies Christ when a little girl says, you're one of his, aren't you? Oh, not me. <laughs> and then the Lord later on by the fire catches him and he says, Peter, do you love me? You know what he's trying to do? He's not trying to convince Peter that he loves him. He's trying to convince Peter that Jesus still loves him. He could have just left him alone. Say, after what you did to me. We do that, don't we? Yeah, I know. Thankfully for a faithful God, he still, su still supplies our every need. Quite frankly, he's, <laughs> I don't know about in your life, but in mine, he is way beyond every need. I'm in the most of my most frivolous wants, and God's still supplying. God's still, still giving and still encouraging and still saying, yeah, enjoy yourself. God isn't hard. The Christian life isn't difficult. The difficult life is trying to live like a Christian when you really want to live like the world. Man, you fight against yourself. You're not just fighting against the Lord. You're fighting against yourself. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Absolutely true. There's one more call I want to look at. We'll finish up on this one here in just a minute. This is one that is not on the surface of it particularly encouraging. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, Paul writes in verse 10, speaking of the Lord Jesus, and anybody here think Paul didn't know Jesus? Oh, he knew him really well. But you know what he wanted? A growing relationship. He didn't want it stagnant. He didn't want a static relationship. He wanted something that's going to continually grow, draw him in, lift him up. Pull him closer. It says in chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Anybody in here say, oh, Lord, please familiarize me with your sufferings. Lord, I want to suffer just like you did. Lord, lay that on me. Even Paul, I mean, he had, he had a, probably as good a look at that as any man that ever lived. He cried out to the Lord three times for relief from, from some physical burdens that he had. And three times the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my, you're, you're, uh, my, my grace is perfected in your weakness. 
if Paul had got his sight back, if Paul had done whatever, uh, if God had done whatever Paul wanted, Paul might have been a little more remote from God. But that need that he had to be close to the Lord, the Lord said, nope, nope. And this all comes back to the, to, the, to the real goal of God, I think, in our lives. Anybody here happy when everything's going your way? <laughs> what a stupid question, preacher. Yeah. How about when it isn't? The Lord Jesus Christ walked through this world. It says he was despised and rejected of men. They considered him smitten of God and stricken. Imagine that. Here's, here's the God that sits in, in glory. And the cherubs walk around saying, holy, 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 day and night for eternity. And he comes down here and men's pull his beard out, stab him with a spear, drive nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Father, kill them all. No, that's not what he said. That's probably what we'd say. God, get them. You can't let them do that to me. He realized that that was part of God's plan. He said, boy, that's a horrible plan. It's a perfect plan. Saved you, didn't it? You know, in God, in our, in our life, when Paul says that I might be made conformable to his sufferings, I, listen, I'd be hard-pressed to say I know exactly what that means, but let me, let me put it this way. When that Bible says of Jesus, he says you need to, to, to take up your cross and die daily. And anybody that won't, won't take up that cross is not worthy to be my disciple. He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about us yielding our will, yielding our life to him so that the life that I now live, I can live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow, now I'm beginning to see what that suffering's about. The world's going to treat me like it treated him. Yeah, but in all that suffering, the Lord had some people that loved him, didn't he? He had people that cared about him. He had women that provided for him. He had families that invited him to, to hold their children and bless their children. There's a part of that life that God says, look at that. As the world is just bitter and angry and jealous and envious of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's another part of that world, and it may be a small part, but what a blessed part it is that says, Lord, come into our house. Our house is blessed by your presence. Lord, our fellowship is, is enriched by your company. Everything that we have gets better when you're in control of it. His sufferings, yeah, his sufferings were, were serious. Look with me in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. Well, why was he, why'd he do that? God needed perfect blood, sinless blood. God doesn't have blood. God is a spirit. So he took on the likeness of men that they might have that perfect blood. He didn't take on the likeness of Adam. He took on the likeness of sinful men but without Adam's sin. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The taste you and I had coming, he took it. Took it so we could live. Imagine that, the poison of death. Jesus said, I'll, give me that. I can, I can do this. You can't. I love you enough to do it for you. You can't. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory. Well, that sounds like a pretty worthwhile cause until you think, yeah, that's us. <laughs> we're we're going to bring glory in there? We did read that. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
bringing in many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Down in verse uh, 16 it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. How many of you ever witnessed to somebody and they gave you, kind of throw out an excuse, you just don't know what it's like. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know how bad it is. They might be right. By the time you get to my age, you've been through a lots of stuff from almost any angle you could look at it. And there are very few things that anybody could say, you don't understand. Well, if you're talking about higher math, I'd agree with you. <laughs> I don't understand that. I'm still thinking two and two equals four. According to this new stuff, it maybe it doesn't anymore. But I understand about suffering. I understand about hopes and aspirations and desires and wants and needs and just being crushed. I understand about friends forsaking you. I understand about people that you love and care about. Give you one of the, yeah, they don't care about you. I understand all that stuff. You know, God, in order to become the Savior we needed, had some things he needed to learn. And it says he learned su uh, suffering. How, how'd that work? God is a spirit. Anybody think a spirit suffers? What could you do to God to hurt him? It certainly couldn't be physical. So Jesus Christ takes on everything that we are so that no one could ever look in and say, Jesus, you just don't understand. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Our call to suffering, oftentimes, I think, is so that we can understand the suffering of others. Man, I look at the things my wife is going through and it's, uh, it, it's, it's just heartbreaking. You say, isn't there another way? Not that I know of. I, if there was, I'd be looking for it. Well, what's God's plan in all that stuff? I don't know. Maybe make us soft, tender-hearted. Maybe make us a little more thoughtful. Maybe make us a little more considerate. Maybe to look. Do you ever think about this? You, you walk through Walmart or a store somewhere and you see some, some little baby at all disfigured and kind of bent up in a, in a little stroll. And you think, oh my goodness, how awful that must be for the parent to look at a life of a child that is going to be a child and never able to do anything for itself. And yet, you know what they're doing? Here's mom taking care of that little baby. And that little baby's going to grow up loved and cared for. You know what she is? She becomes a picture of uh, love. Maybe that's what the Lord's trying to teach us. Be patient. Lord, learn some things about the heartbreak of, uh, of loss. Anybody remember what, uh, what the Bible says through your uh, Bible memorization uh, courses when, uh, when Lazarus died? <laughs> Anybody remember what Jesus, what the comment was about Jesus in that? Jesus wept. He's God manifest in the flesh. He knows what he's going to do. He's got it all planned out. He's already let them know. Listen, I'll be there. Don't you worry about a thing. I got it. I think what he's weeping for is Mary and Martha. 
These poor ladies don't understand who I am. They don't understand what, what glory is yet to be revealed. And a lot of the times we don't get those things. We look at the things of, of the immediate as, oh God, how could you let this happen? He says, man, wait till you see how this is going to end. And we try and rush God through all of his uh, performances to be good for us. And they are good for us, but they're not going to be rushed. Imagine how Jesus felt when Peter betrayed him. This, this is strange. Does God know everything? Does he know the end from the beginning? I mean, the Bible says he does, so I, it's a rhetorical question. So when Jesus walks out of that meeting hall on this trial, and he sees Peter warming his hands there, denying that he knows him, what do you think Jesus is thinking? Just a matter of days, it'll be okay. Well, he didn't bother him at all. Didn't bother him for himself. He knew Peter was going to be all right. Eventually. You know what Jesus saves us from? Ourselves. Ourselves. The more we follow what he says, the closer we can get to him. What do you think Jesus thought about Demas? I've thought about this a lot. I still don't have an answer, but I've thought about it a lot. Demas is on the mission field with Paul and the, some of the other uh, prime men of the church. And Paul's comment was he, he, he left us having loved this present world. Still saved. Maybe he went back to church. Maybe he just, I don't know what he did. You know what Paul's disappointed out of bet? Demas, what are you thinking? Man, you, you, I mean, you, you had it going for you, and you just turned your back. What's the Lord going to do for you now? Don't lose our place with the Lord. He's called us to serve Him. He's called us to be uh, His people. He's called us for all of these things, for grace, for enrichment. For, uh, to be patient, to be blameless, to, to walk in fellowship with him. He's faithful in all that he's said, all that he's done. And he's called us to suffering. And, oh, Lord, I was doing good right up till that part. I don't know about you, but a suffering doesn't really uh, just ring any big bells on my radar screen. But if God says you need to do that, maybe it would be one of them times just to kind of tighten your belt up a notch and say, Lord... If it'll make me what you want, if it'll help me to be the person, the man you want me to be, Lord, you just do it and help me to understand what the plan is. Let's stand. I know a lot of our folks going through really tough times. I'm with you. And maybe some of this stuff is the Lord just a uh, little test, see if we're going to hang tight to him or somehow forget that he's the only answer in life and chase after the world. I don't know what God's plans are in those things. All I know is this, if the Lord Jesus Christ had to learn some things by it, we're not likely to be exempt from it. Let's uh, let's sing.